D. James Kennedy Ministries presents Truths That Transform. Did you ever stop to think that without the resurrection, even the cross is meaningless? We are hearing scholars and experts saying that this is one of the most significant discoveries in the last 50 years. This is Truths That Transform. Thank you for joining us on this Palm Sunday edition of Truths That Transform, which is a viewer-supported program of D. James Kennedy Ministries. I'm Frank Wright, and I invite you to visit our ministry website, where you can find a wide variety of outstanding free content, including articles, videos, audio, and many print resources as well. You can find it all at djameskennedy.org. As Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the crowds cheered him. But by Friday, a lynch mob cried out for his crucifixion. The scriptures had testified to Christ, but many refused to believe the word. And that's a situation that still persists in our day. The Bible tells us the truth, but will we believe it or attempt to water it down or diminish it? Well, we have a well-qualified guest here to shed light on that topic today. Joining us is Dr. Peter Lilbach president of Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, where he also serves as professor of historical theology. He has co-edited the book, Thy Word is Still Truth, Essential Writings on the Doctrine of Scripture from the Reformation to Today. In addition to his important scholarship, he has personally fought the battle to preserve biblical integrity in his own institution. Dr. Lilbach, thanks for joining us today. We're delighted to have you with us. Frank, it's a great joy, and thanks for sharing this opportunity to talk a little bit about our commitment to Scripture at Westminster Seminary. Yeah. Biblical inerrancy is, is critically important to our understanding of God's revelation to us. Inerrant means that whatever the Bible means to tell us from God is always true. Mm -hmm. The Bible does not deceive us. It cannot give us an error on any fact or any truth that it intends to communicate. I believe the Bible following Jesus says the scriptures cannot be broken. He says that, for example, in John, the, uh, the fourth gospel. And so this doctrine of inerrancy is based upon Jesus' own teaching. Uh, when the Bible says God is not a man that he should lie, it tells us that God, if He's revealing Himself, which we've already said a thousand times, the Bible is giving us the claim God speaks, then we should expect it to be the truth. Sure. But what our statement of faith of inerrancy and infallibility means is that when God gave us His Word in written form, and we understand it the way He intended it, it is absolutely true, and we build our lives upon that. Hmm. Within great Christian institutions down through the centuries, uh, maybe perhaps best highlighted at the Reformation itself, biblical fidelity or confidence in the Scripture sort of waxes and wanes. That happens with individuals as well, where they have doubts about what they're believing in the Scriptures. This is something you've had some experience with yourself, haven't you, about an institution that you're associated with that, that uh, at least had some challenges in whether or not uh, the, the Bible was accepted as is commonly understood. I think one of the important principles of all leadership, doesn't matter whether it's political, academic, yeah. spiritual, is called accountability. accountability yeah. That we have to every once in a while say, okay, okay, Frank, do you really believe what you're representing here on our show? Truths that trans, do you believe these truths? They need to ask you that. They need to ask me that. Mm -hmm. We need to ask our professors that. We need to ask our pastors that. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, we should not be embarrassed by that. That's actually a biblical principle. Uh, when Paul was with the Ephesian elders, he said you need to keep watch over yourselves because out of your own midst will come wolves who will seek to devour the flock. It's th sometimes the greatest opponents to our faith is not out there. It's right here in the middle. We hold to the Westminster Confession of Faith. By the way, Dr. Kennedy's Topical Study Bible loves the Westminster Catechism and Confession. I can see it as I've thumbed through this new Bible. Yeah. But uh, what I think we need to realize then is that uh, academic liberty means I have the freedom to pursue my direction, but an institution has academic liberty too. 
It has the freedom yes. to say we are free to protect Absolutely. our institutional values. And when those collide, then I think if in a confessional school we say, well, then it's probably time for you to find a new place to teach, which we welcome. But if you want a teacher, this is our value system. This is our structure. These are our commitments. And so uh, we take a very high vow at Westminster that says, as long as I teach here, I will do nothing to suppress the authority and truthfulness of Scripture. And if my views change, I will report them. And I'm willing to accept the fact that I don't belong in this school. Now, I'm paraphrasing our vow. Sure, But sure. that's the implication. So I think uh, academic <clears throat> liberty is an absolute importance of, for all scholars, but it should be exercised with respect in the institution you're part of. There's one historic fact recorded in the scripture that the apostle told us, our faith stands and falls on it, and that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If the Bible were not inerrant, that would be subject to question, as would just about every other major teaching in the Bible, correct? Inerrancy is not something uh, that's a theological or philosophical debate. It stands as this indisputable fact of history that has changed the world. And it's when you come to realize the risen Christ and you trust Him, then the concept of inerrancy makes absolute sense because you said, if God can raise the dead and even predicted it would happen, well then, if he says this is his word, it's so easy to accept that because that seems an awful lot easier than the impossible mm. miracle mm. of resurrection from the dead. So I want to make it clear, Paul doesn't say, if we don't have an inerrant Bible, you can't be a Christian. He puts it around the other way. If we don't have a resurrection, you don't have anything. But if you have a risen Christ, then the infallibility and inerrancy and reliability of the scriptures go hand in hand with that. You know God can do this. Absolutely. Yeah. Pete, thanks for being with us. It's we've great we've joy enjoyed to meet you, having you here. God bless you. Thanks so much. Okay. Without the biblical testimony, we have no basis for our faith. Without the New Testament, we would know virtually nothing about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But as Dr. D. James Kennedy points out, thankfully, we do have God's Word, and it gives us many infallible proofs of the death-defeating resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the greatest person that ever lived. And one of the reasons for that is He solved the greatest problem that mankind ever has or does face, and that is the problem of death. No matter how wealthy you are, how successful, how famous you might be, how beautiful or handsome, death will overtake you and will grind you into the dust. And you will be buried beneath the sod and people will walk on your face and have forgotten who you were, as it is true of most all of the people in any cemetery, even in this town, should you walk in the midst of the stones. But Christ, and Christ only, gives us hope beyond the grave. The greatest of intellects has quavered before this ultimate last enemy of death. The genius of Greek philosophy, Plato, was asked this question. Will we rise again? And Plato, with all of, its, all of his brilliance, said, quote, I hope so, but no man may know, unquote. Plato, I know I will rise again. Sorry about you, old boy. The Christians knew in the midst of a world of uncertainty, one thing that stands out is their certainty. I know whom I have believed, the Bible says. And the apostles were sure that they would live again. It's what transformed them. Now, many people think that Christianity is some sort of a leap into the dark. You should know that most of the arguments that are leveled against Christianity are true for all pagan religions, but they're not true for Christ and Christianity. And so they take things which are true everywhere but Christianity, and they aim them only at Christianity, such as this, religion is a leap into the dark. 
That's true for every pagan religion. But only Christianity is based upon evidence. And since the resurrection is the principal foundation of Christianity, every infidel from the first century down has aimed its biggest guns at the resurrection and tried his best to destroy it, but all in vain. He showed himself alive after his passion, his death, by many infallible proofs for 40 days, for almost six weeks to many people, one and three, two and seven and 10 and 11 and 11 and 500 and more people saw Christ, they heard him, they handled him and came to believe that he was indeed alive. It is based upon evidence where every other religion is based simply upon the authority of the person that speaks. Christianity is not a leap into the dark, it is a leap out of the dark and into the light of evidence. How wonderful that is. One of the evidences for the resurrection of Christ is, is so obvious people don't think about it. It's very simply this, the Christian church. Do you think of the Christian church as an evidence for the resurrection? You should. Because you see, Christianity, like no other religion, is based upon the teaching that Christ rose from the dead. From the very first sermon on Pentecost that Peter preached, he talked about the prophecies that God would raise him from the dead. He talked about the fact that he had been raised from the dead, that the leaders of the Jewish state, these had with wicked hands taken and crucified him, but God had raised him from the dead and that God could raise them as well. And from that point on, the whole Christian church was spread through its central doctrine that God raised Christ from the dead. Historians acknowledge that's how the Christian religion was spread, by the fact that Christ rose from the dead. And he was seen by one and two and three and seven and 10 and 11 and 11 and 500 and others most of which suffered for their testimony. Most all of the apostles except one died for their testimony. Principal Hill from Scotland described that, I think, better than anybody I have read. He said this, that when you look at all the evidence for the resurrection, he says, quote, but if notwithstanding every appearance of truth, you suppose their testimony, the testimony of the apostles, to be false, then inexplicable circumstances of glaring absurdity crowd in upon you. You must suppose that 12 men of mean birth, of no education, living in that humble station which placed ambitious views out of their reach and far from their thoughts, without any aid from the state, that they formed the noblest scheme which has ever entered into the mind of man, adopted the most daring means of executing that scheme and conducted it with such address as to conceal the imposture under the semblance of simplicity and virtue. You must further suppose that men guilty of blasphemy and falsehood united in an attempt the best contrived and which proved the most successful for making the world virtuous and that they formed this singular enterprise without seeking any advantage to themselves, with an avowed contempt for loss and profit, and with a certain expectation of scorn and persecution, and that although conscious of one another's villainy, none of them ever thought of providing for his own security by disclosing the fraud, but that amidst amidst sufferings, the most grievous of flesh and blood, to conceal their conspiracy. They continued on until all of them had been killed, with no one ever changing his story. Those that can swallow such suppositions, says Principal Hill, have no title. to complain about miracles. No one ever yet gave his life for what he knew 
to be a lie. No, my friends, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that tremendous foundation, the rock of Gibraltar, on which Christianity rests. Jesus Christ showed himself alive by many, by many infallible proofs so that the lives of the disciples were transformed because he overcame the greatest problem that we will ever face. You and I are going to die. He's the only one that can say, I am he that was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And you that believe in me, that trust in me, shall live also. American writer and extraordinary wit Mark Twain once said, faith is believing what you know ain't so. Well, that seems to be a popular notion, even among some professing Christians. But as you've just seen, biblical faith rests on the bedrock of historical reality. Many have tried to attack the scriptures from different angles, but anyone who takes the time to examine the evidence, including from history and archeology, span we'll see that the stones cry out in support of the trustworthiness of the Bible. Tragically, many college professors and mainstream media reports imply that the Bible has somehow been disproven by history or by science. Dr. Paul Meyer, best-selling author and retired professor of ancient history. There is so much attack on the reliability of scripture from uh, the groves of academia in the secular world, uh, not everywhere, but uh, you see it primarily in the media. And it's kind of ridiculous because more and more evidence piles up, it seems, every other month on new discoveries being made in the Holy Land. But about 90% of them immediately confirm the biblical record, Old or New Testament. Ever since scientific archaeology began in 1870 with the Schliemann excavations at Troy, and it's been pursued scientifically ever since. Time and again, we find that the critics have to uh, experience a 99-yard loss uh, because of the new discoveries being made. Consider a few key archaeological finds just from the last several decades. We find uh, the name of Pontius Pilate showing up, for example, in 1962 in the Italian excavations at Caesarea on the waterfront there. When in the previous century, one of the uh, critics named Bruno Bauer doubted that Pontius Pilate ever lived. He said he was uh, uh, added to the biblical records to make it look historical because Jesus never lived. So he claimed, well, that's all of course not in a cocked hat. Spring in 1986, a marvelous discovery was made of a boat that Jesus and the disciples could have used. It shows that this was an ambidextrous hull it could either be rowed or sailed. In 1991, archaeologists found a first century ossuary or bone box with elaborate designs. Implying there's a VIP inside there, and then on the other side, the VIP's name was inscribed twice in Aramaic, Yosef bar Kaifa, Yosef bar Kaifa. We're talking about Joseph Caiaphas, the chief priest of the Sanhedrin, who indicted Jesus before Pontius Pilate on that wonderful morning called Good Friday. Now in 2009, uh, the Roman Catholics had built a shrine or were in the process of building a shrine at Magdala, which is at the westernmost end of the bulge of the harp in the harp-shaped Sea of Galilee. We found a synagogue from the first century, and there were only seven. This is also, on a side note, academically interesting because many uh, experts were claiming that there are no such thing as synagogues until after the temple is destroyed. Father Eamon Kelly of Ireland lives where this synagogue was found in the town of Magdala. You know that name Magdala, Mary Magdala, first witness of the resurrection. And in that town we find a synagogue and it's on the side of the Sea of Galilee, on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. When Jesus would walk from Nazareth all the way to Capernaum, along the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee, he would hit the lake at Magdala. It's even more significant because it has frescoes and mosaics, so it's the most beautiful of the seven synagogues. The other six do not have frescoes and mosaics. 
Inside the synagogue, there's um, a stone that's carved. It's about knee high, the height of a seat of a chair. The stone is decorated on the four sides and on the top. It was stunning when the archaeologists discovered that there was a menorah on the stone. This is the first menorah outside of Jerusalem. It's also the first menorah found in a religious context. There has not been any discovery like this up to now. Probably the understanding will be challenged and maybe it will take decades for the dust to settle and a peaceful consensus to be reached regarding the significance of the stone. We are hearing scholars and experts saying that this is one of the most significant discoveries in the last 50 years. Uh, this is happening again and again whereby the hard evidence from the past in the form of archaeological artifacts, the smoking gun from the ancient world, I call it, the DNA evidence that comes along and will turn a trial on its ear. This is now coming thick and fast at us from this wonderful latter-day gift of God called archaeology, which has been around such a short time. As you've been seeing on today's program, the Bible is the only truly trustworthy book ever written. It is the Word of God. And since He's the one who created us as rational beings, He gives us rational reasons for believing His truth. The Bible has stood the test of time, taking on all comers who would try to tear it down. And the truth of the Bible has inspired cultures formed the basis for religious and political freedom, literally shaping the world and driving most of the charitable good works done around the world today. And we are excited to be offering a very special resource that will help you not only see how this power has worked, but to experience it more deeply yourself. Here's my dear friend, Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy with more. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Frank. The Word of God is transformational. Nobody believed that more fervently than my father, Dr. D. James Kennedy. He spent his life studying the Bible and then boldly preaching it. And the fruits of nearly 50 years of that ministry are now gathered together for the first time in the brand new D. James Kennedy Topical Study Bible. For decades, people asked my father to put together a study Bible. And now that Bible is a reality featuring over 700 notes and articles from my dad alongside the modern English version of the Bible and bound in genuine leather, this study Bible is truly my father's magnum opus. He was well known for fearlessly tackling the major issues of the day, applying God's word to current events. And this Bible helps you do the same thing. I don't know of any study Bible that covers such a wide range of issues from the Apostles' Creed to whether the Bible teaches socialism and everything in between. I want to send you a copy of the new D. James Kennedy Topical Study Bible as our thanks for your generous donation of $100 or more to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at Box 6085, Albert Lee, Minnesota 56007 or call toll free 888-334-9762 or go online to djameskennedy.org. And for a limited time, if you're able to donate $200 or more, we'll send you a copy of the D. James Kennedy Topical Study Bible and we'll send one to a pastor or seminary student. If you ever listen to my father, you know how rare his courage and insight are. America needs much more of it for such a time as this. Help us to get this unique Bible into the hands of America's pastors and future pastors so that they too can connect the Bible with the massive changes in the moral and political landscape we're experiencing today. We'll send you a new copy of the D. James Kennedy Topical Study Bible as thanks for your generous donation of $100 or more. Or we'll send you a copy Plus, we'll send a copy to a pastor or seminary student for your donation of $200 or more. Simply write to us at Box 6085, Albert Lee, Minnesota 56007 or call toll free 888-334-9762 or go online to djameskennedy.org.
One of the persistently recurring myths of recent decades is that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalena, despite the fact that there's not a single scrap of evidence for that assertion, none whatsoever. But what's not always clear is why Bible-believing Christians so oppose this fallacious notion. It's not because there's anything inherently wrong with the idea of Jesus being married. It's because it's not true. It's because that's not what the Gospels and the rest of the Bible teach. The Bible is a book rooted in history. And that history shows that Jesus was not married to Mary Magdalena or to any other woman. But though this is an historical fact, there's also a theological reason behind it. Jesus is indeed a groom, and he does indeed have a bride. That bride is not a now dead woman from the first century era. That bride is his people, the church of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Ephesians, says this, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and the church. In other words, according to the Bible, human marriage is actually a profound analogy of Christ's relationship with his church. This should be a source of great comfort and joy to the Christian. Christ loves us, protects us, provides for us, cares for us, just as a perfect husband would care for his bride. And indeed, Christ gave his very life for us so that we could live eternally in his presence. The problem with the supposed marriage between Jesus and Mary Magdalena isn't the idea of marriage itself, it's that such a marriage would be far too small. Jesus is a groom, a groom on a celestial scale. The Lord of glory came to earth to take for himself a bride. He's not some adulterer or bigamist. He has one bride, his church, consisting of all those who know him, trust him, and love him. And we can all be thankful for that. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us this week on Truths That Transform. We'll see you next time. Next week on Truths That Transform. The resurrection is the unassailable fortress of Christianity. As a Christian, I firmly believe he did rise from the dead, and I can almost prove it. That's next week. Today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.